Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part four of the life of Omar Khayyam, where we continue to delve into the fascinating story of this renowned Persian polymath. In this installment, we explore Khayyam's years, his significant contributions to mathematics, astronomy, and poetry, as well as his enduring legacy. Join us as we uncover the trials and triumphs that shaped Khayyam's life and career, from his early education in Nishapur to his influential work in fields ranging from algebra to philosophy, discover how his timeless poetry continues to resonate with audiences worldwide centuries after his passing. Don't miss this insightful journey into the world of Omar Khayyam, a figure whose brilliance and creativity continue to inspire us to this day. Subscribe to our channel for more videos on history, culture, and the lives of remarkable individuals like Khayyam. Enjoy the show. Omar is calm, soulfully free. He is alert and powerful. His mind is imperturbably clear. He will write his treatise. He will write it. Three dirhams, Eunice whispered to him in the courtyard. Huh? Omar did not understand as far away from Eunice and his worries as ever. That'll be three dirhams. Oh yes. Omar gave him ten in joy. Algebra, al mukabala Eunice mutters angrily. Eunice, the butler himself, wanders to the bazaar, while the thieving jackal of his evil thoughts prowls around the young Omar Khayyam. We too studied in Madrasa, and we know that there is no dumber science than algebra. But it turns out it has its price, eh? A table and shelter and care and money and me take care of him. No, let him pour over his vague proofs and I'll refute them. Or am I more foolish than he? Can I read and write? If he can read and write as a snot-nosed boy, I, a grown-up, experienced, clever man, will master it in no time. Write, my dear. Write your treatise. When the hour comes, I'll shame you. Anything on algebra? He asked in the bookcase. A book on algebra and al mukabala by Muhammad al Khwarizmi, replied one of the merchants. That's the one. How much? Four dirhams? Oh, all right. Give it here. With the book under his arm, he walked towards the tavern and ran into Ali Jafar, the janitor, who was buying a new broom. Oh! Ali Jafar was surprised. You, and suddenly with a book. Why do you need it? Wait, Eunice said ominously. I'll show your learned friend. Show him. Why? I hate him. Already? Why? Well, he's like this. Like what? Well, something. Not like that. I see. Jafar grinned. But my advice, you'd better not touch him. That's right. He's not like that. Leave the man alone. No, I won't leave him alone. As long as he's alive. Eunice went under the awning with a book under his arm. When he saw the book, he was immediately given a place on the platform covered with stained koshma. Aha! Uh -huh. In the East, the common people in our country respect scholarly people. But, they say, in some country in the sunset, either rum or rus, the smarter a man is the more offenses he gets from the ignorant. Algebra, al mukabala Am I more stupid than him? Do I not know how to read and write? He eagerly opened the book and flipped through it. Oh my god. Numbers. Icons. Hmm. Well, that's okay. We'll figure it out. Here's one. The item refers to... Uh, a square. As a... A square to a, a cube. Hence it necessarily follows that an equation containing a square and a cube is equivalent to an equation containing a thing and a square. Uh, what could that mean? For a long time Eunice sat on the platform, angrily leafing through the book, but to no avail. The hardest boulder will bear the mark of a chisel, but Eunice's brain was harder than any stone, and no sharp corner shown in the book left the slightest scratch on it. Eunice asked for a hashish pipe, but his mind became even more foggy. The butler even paled with hatred for the man, 
who not only had an excellent grasp of this devilishness, but could quite refute or prove it. No, we must start from the basics. I would go to the madrasa, to the mathematician Zubair. Even the master had asked him for help more than once. True, it would cost six of the remaining dirhams, but what sacrifices would not be made for the sake of knowledge? Algebra, algebra, al mukabala Write, my good man, write your treatise. The hour will come. The ruddy sweet Zubair is very pleased with Eunice. Did the honorable judge of judges send for me? I'll be right there. Don't be in a hurry, said the butler dryly. The honorable judge of judges no longer needs your services. He has his own mathematician at home now, a very gifted young man. Young. Zubair was frightened, gifted, and, at once exhausted, slumped his fat ass on the cot. From what swamps did he come? The Nishapur swamps. Damn it! Zubair jumped up and ran around the cell. His bulky belly was swaying from side to side like a sheep's curd. We lived quietly, peacefully, in prosperity. Where do these gifted people come from? It would seem they've all been killed off long ago. So I've lost my rightful income? Your master won't give you any more money. No, confirmed Eunice. He's lavishing money on his new assistant. He gave him 200 dirhams this morning. Oh Allah, what's his name? Omar Khayyam. Never heard of him. Well, I have. Khayyam Khayyam, that's a strange nickname. Is it from the Arabic Kaima for tent or Kaya for snake? That's the most likely, what to do? Zubair stared helplessly at Yunus. We can't let some young man, a foreign trickster, steal our bread. Besides, he will be writing a treatise on algebra for the judge, said the cruel Eunice. Oh, it's getting worse by the hour. He's going to ruin us. What shall we do, eh? I'm here. Eunice showed him a book. You? Oh my god. A loud laughter almost tore Zubair's gut and the butler's hearing. My dear darling, you'd better not try it. It's too late. I've been doing algebra all my life, and sometimes I come to such a dead end that I can beat my head against the wall. Then, wheezed a distressed Eunice. What am I going to do with this stupid book? Where am I going to put it? Leave it. Muhammad al Khwarizmi. I'll look through it. I've never read it before. The butler was lying. I bought it for six dirhams. Good, I'll pay for it, someday. He fell back on the couch. Shall we? Zubair rubbed his low forehead with the palm of his hand. Invite him to the madrasa, test him and ridicule him with the whole assembly. No, it's dangerous. If he really is a scholar, he will ridicule all of us. Shame on the whole country. Shame, shame. Listen. Zubair jumped up. Didn't you notice if he has any flaw? Any flaw, a vice, a bad habit. At 22, well, who knows? Remember what a scoundrel you were at 22. What if he's a cad or a drunkard? He's not. He doesn't even smoke hashish, the bastard. Too bad. We'll wait. When did he arrive? Yesterday. Hey, let's wait. If there's a wormhole in him, He'll manifest it soon enough. You watch. See if there's anything you can pick up on and blow it all over Tehran. Or better yet, try to lure him into a trap yourself. He doesn't live without women, does he? Give him a daughter. Let her stay with him and she'll cry out. He took her by force, violated her maiden's honor. That won't work, pal. Her maiden honor was violated a long time ago. Well can be faked. Come on, you want to put me in jail? Forget who his patron is. Yes, Zubair sighed sadly. A judge of judges is not a street watchman. Well, don't worry. We'll think of something. We'll get him anyway. Well, we'll get him. You bet we will. It's not the first time. 
Algebra, algebra, algebra. al Mukabala. Write, my good man. Write your treatise. Evening. Omar lit the lamp, and immediately a cloud of foul things swept in from the garden. Furry red butterflies, thin creatures in snow-white dresses and wings, bugs of all kinds. Since childhood, Omar had hated flies, gnats, worms, bugs to the point of disgust. Some harmless bug, caught by the scruff of his neck, horrified him like a scorpion. Only ants did not disgust him. They seemed kind, intelligent, pure. On the garden paths he looked under his feet, not to step on the merrily scurrying ants. The flying filth dazedly flitted around the lamp, burned, fell, flew up again, and of course climbed up by the scruff of the neck. No, they won't let him work. Omar put the lamp against the far wall, and the whole swarm of insects moved after the flame. And then Omar saw the monster, slowly moving its paws with a crouch. It crept cat-like along the wall. A jump and the bug was gone, and the fight began. He watched the big toad for a long time without moving. How did it get here? Shocked by its incredible veracity, he would aim, jump, smack, and the bug was gone. Aim, smack, and no white fairy with silk wings. Isn't that what they're called, Golden Eye? She devoured dozens of these insidious, gorgeous fairies. But she wasn't afraid of the large dark beetles encased in hard shells. They fought back desperately. When she swallowed another one, she rolled over on her back and clutched her belly with her paws. It seemed that the beetle was scratching her from inside with its thick toothed legs. But after a moment or two, the gray predator again rushed into battle. One might envy the toad's digestion. It would be interesting to dissect it and see how its stomach is organized. I wish a man had one of those. Otherwise, another eats a juicy plum and squirms in pain, unhappy. In general, the toad is a marvelous creation of nature. It is worthy, if not love, then respect. Who else with such an ugly appearance? has such a ringing voice, scattered at night thoughtful long gentle trill. Not like her sister Frog's vile, ghastly quacking. He did not work so as not to disturb her. And he didn't put out the lamp, let the toad hunt. At dawn, when he woke up, he took a dustpan and a broom from the yard and carefully took her out into the garden. Live and be happy, God's creature. Learned but simple, soulful. He's his own man. He's easy. He's good. I wish there were more of them. Otherwise, when someone memorizes five or six sayings from the Quran, he turns his nose away from us, gray ignoramuses. We must warn him. Eunice is planning something evil. When a person realizes why he hates someone, it is terrible. It is three times more terrible when a person hates someone blindly and stupidly just because he is something different. He can stab a sleeping man, strangle him, pour poison into his ear. Barefooted Ali Jafar crept noiselessly across the quince to the open window of the room where Omar, cross-legged and deep in thought, sat cross-legged over a low table with a circular and a ruler over sheets of paper speckled with calculations. No, perhaps we should not disturb him. Thought is a bird. If you scare it away, you can't get it back. Let him think. Let him write. He's doing a good deed. If there's order in the treasury, there'll be some order in the country. And maybe Ali Jafar won't be a beggar janitor for the rest of his life. He should get married, have a house, children, become a man, he will look after the cunning Eunice himself, moment after moment and spring after spring. Don't spend them without song and wine, for in the realm of being there is no good higher than life. Omar stretched his stiff legs, stretched them under the table, fell back on the carpet, folded his hands under his head. Oh, bliss! Every vein, given a different tension, quivered with pleasure. My whole body ached. It was like being beaten with sticks. It's hard to breathe. 
the whole body stiffens, and the racked brain is stiff. It's like a crack in it, like a bruised bone. On the middle finger of my right hand, on the middle joint, a callus from a reed pen. He's been sitting there night after night, day after day. Omar couldn't tell. In his youth, he had disbelieved the amazing story of Ferdowsi, who had worked patiently on the book for 25 hard years. But now he knew it was not fiction. Worse than any disease is writing. It's a kind of binge, an addiction. He began, however, in the first days, a little at a time, in the morning on a fresh head, and barely feeling fatigue, threw down the pen, went wandering around the city. Clarity. Mathematics is clarity. But the further Kayam penetrated into the wilds of mysterious figures and numbers, the more difficult it became for him to return from these wilds. And strangely enough, the more clarity grew. However, it was already threatening to become suddenly blurred. The brain gradually freeing itself from extraneous impressions, all filled with equations and detached from everything in the world except them, as if choked on them, and even deep at night, in sleep, could not calm down, digesting formulas like a boa constrictor swallowed animal. Omar ate and drank, not noticing what he was eating and drinking, what Eunice would slip him, chicken, stalabraid, bitter radish. As soon as Omar takes a bite of food, an old thought flashes up in his mind, or is minted, becomes complete, like a clump of disheveled wool in a ball of yarn. Omar, forgetting about food, hurries to his desk and grabs a quill. The line between reality and dream was imperceptibly erased. Omar ran his palm over his face. It was so greasy that the palm was thickly covered with grease. There was something furry on his cheeks, on his chin, on his upper lip. Ruffled his hair, stiff, dirty. No, that's enough. You can't do that. Wine, for example, is useful, but its harm is greater than its good, so you must drink in moderation. Work, too. If you're exhausted, you won't be able to write anything. It's time to shake things up, take a break. He heard somewhere in the garden, behind the outbuildings, a heavy intermittent knocking. It was like a blow on the head. Omar had caught it earlier in the morning, but had missed it in his calculations. Now, when he stopped his work, the thumping, rare and frequent, tinkling and muffled, accompanied by a dull, incomprehensible grinding, as if coming through a cracked wooden pipe, rudely squawked in his ears. Shit. I was told to keep quiet. Irritated, Omar left the room and walked across the courtyard to the garden. He cooled down a little. It's a bit cold in the garden. Look, it's already fall. Already the leaves are falling from the trees. The trees are covered with gypsy shawls, and there are no colors here. Bright yellow, yellow with green, red, rusty brown, gray-blue. But juicier, more colorful than all the color of apricot leaves. Dark cherry, black and purple, pure purple and egg yellow. Especially now when, touched by the dampness dissolved in the cold air, it quietly glows under the cooling sun. Did a hurricane blow through the garden? It had thinned, it was bare, it lay all in huge stumps. We will renew the garden in spring, Ali Jafar said, smiling. The sick old walnut trees have all withered. It is necessary to remove them. I have been working since dawn. He kicked a bulky stump with a thick iron wedge sticking out of it. Oh, I am tired. I'm uprooting splitting it for firewood. But how can I do this much work alone? I won't make it till winter. Give it to me. Omar took the big hammer from him. What do you mean? It's not something for your delicate hands. Stand back. Omar swung and struck the wedge so hard that the iron went deep and the stump snapped in two. Wow, Ali Jafar exclaimed, dry-fingered but strong. From Nishapur turnips, Omar grinned. Famous turnips, he remembered his obnoxious traveling companion. A wagon costs only three fells. 
Hasn't he carried enough bales of heavy cloth in his father's workshop? And bales and tightly packed sacks of grain and flour from the wagons to the barn. You'll get stronger. Ali Jafar. I've been cutting and stabbing them all my life. I'm a villager. Here, by bad fate. Our village has fallen into the blessed vakuf of wandering monks. You know those saints. They don't even take taxes from them, but they get everything. Totally ruined the community. I had to find work in the city. Wakuf? Omar went dark. Ikta, Wakuf. Not only does the right faith cripple a man's brain and soul, it cripples his life by taking away his bread. Having settled down in Samarkand, Omar sent a letter to his relatives in Nishapur. How are they there? Unhappy. No reply yet. It's a long caravan journey. It's the same everywhere, he said gloomily. Except that somewhere in the country of Rus, a man's life is a little easier. God knows. Where is it, the country of Rus? They say it's good where we are not. I know one thing. It is good everywhere for the rich and bad everywhere for the poor. Yes, I suppose so. The fresh air had quickened Omar's stagnant blood. Breathing fully, he was flushed and cheerful. But still he felt dizzy from the unusual effort, and tears came to his eyes. You know what? Give up stumping, Ali Jafar said. No, I enjoyed it. Omar banged his hammer on the wedge. For you it's recreation, fun, grumbled a disgruntled Ali Jafar. And for me, I won't be able to manage all this housekeeping till winter. He looked angrily at the mountain of stumps and fallen gray trunks. If you want to do a good deed, tell your master to hire two or three helpers, for a while, until all the wood is split. I will. And you, if you want to wake up from the deedly occupation of science, Ali Jafar advise it him and return to your human form. Go to the bathhouse. Let the bath attendant rub your skin, knead your joints and muscles. You will revive at once. Omar would love to. That's right, thank you. I wouldn't have thought of it myself. I'm kinda clueless right now. I'm not thinking straight. I bet you are. Omar's in the spacious locker room. He wrapped a sheet around his bare thighs, threw a special bathrobe over his shoulders, and slapped his bare feet on the wet stone floor. The hall for cold ablutions. Then, the hot room. A series of star-shaped rooms with a vaulted ceiling. Steam over a stone vat of warm water. After laying the visitor on a bench, the bath attendant pounced on the poor man with such fury that he seemed to want to tear off his skin, break off his arms and legs, pull out all the tendons. He rubbed and spanked Omar hard, felt his muscles from his heels to his shoulders, and the back of his head tapped his back and chest with his fists. In short, beat him, crushed and pounded him like a potter with a large lump of clay. Then Omar rinsed himself in hot and cold water. Then he went to the barber. Shave, you'll look like a maiden. You look too soft for a man. Shall we keep the beard or just the mustache? Lobster is dry. Leave the beard and don't talk. His head is already cracking. Is he a bizarre dandy, an idler, to amaze people with a mustache? He's a scientist. A beard suits him. Having finished his work, the wily barber washed him with pink water, and having rubbed him with a cloth, brought him a silver mirror. Well, how is it? It will do, said Omar, nevertheless very pleased with his appearance. You say you have a headache? The barber led him into a light and dry room with a low table and a koshma where he could lie down and rest and put a tray on the table. Here are some raisins, pistachios, and dried oyster mushrooms. Sherbet. But the best thing, of course, 
is to drink a cup of wine now. Wine? Omar was surprised. Is it a sin? It's a sin to get drunk. It's not a sin to drink a cup of wine for good health. Everything in the world was created by God, so was wine. Yes, but the prophet. Oh, my dear, you're a learned man, I see. You must know how many prophets there were. Buddha, Christ, Mani, Muhammad, and a darkness of others. One forbids wine, one forbids meat, one forbids women. Just to infringe on the poor man in some way or another. To hell with them all. But about Christ, do you remember the first miracle he performed? In Cana of Galilee, have you read the gospel? He turned water into excellent wine. What does that tell us? That even a prophet prefers wine to water? Uh, are you a godless man? Why? I believe in God, a creator, but not in the ravings of self-appointed prophets. Man, because he is a man, has the right to joy and love. The barber opened a low chest in the corner and took out a narrow jug. Well, let's say that wine was left to us from the old dark times. It is the heritage of the cursed paganism. And bread, clothes, bed? Muhammad didn't invent them either. Shouldn't we ban them too? We could ban them, of course, but... You know, a weirdo decided to teach his donkey not to eat anything. Took him a long time. Well... The neighbors asked, is your donkey used to eating nothing? It was quite used to it, sighed the weirdo, but suddenly, for some reason, it died. Shall I pour? One bowl, one cup won't hurt, it'll do you good. Talk, talk, Omar grinned. You praise wine because you have to sell it and get money. Even theologians, if they had no other income, would shout about the benefits of wine at every crossroads. The nosy barber looks at Omar expectantly with long, cunning eyes. Well, pour it, Omar grinned. When you leave home, you learn so much that you will not hear in any madrasa. Man is a rebel, and it's not the wine itself. It is wrong to think that if wine is allowed today, Tomorrow, everyone in a Muslim country will be drunk. Whoever wants to drink, drinks now, even if you hang him. If he doesn't want to drink, you can't force him with a stick. It's about prohibition. Prohibition is an insult. It offends even a slave. A man gets tired of countless prohibitions. Without asking him, he is brought into the world and let to waddle along the road, lined with the slingshot of hundreds of strict prohibitions. And this is life? Poor. This world is a trap at every turn. I've never lived a day of my own free will. They make decisions upstairs without me, and then they call me a rebel. That's right, now. But what kind? The barber wondered. Bitter, murky. No, it's bad for someone with a hot temper, and you seem to have one. Basil? No gives you a headache. Old, not good for the gaunt. Ah, I'll pour you some Mavis, a large black grape. It suits a man with a fiery temperament. Drink it slowly, savor it. Eh, said the master concernedly, without grimaces and chuckles, taking out another jug. It would be better, instead of indiscriminately banning wine, to ask us, the wine merchants, and explain to people what kind of wine is harmful and what kind is useful, what excites, what calms, and there would be no drunken and sick people. Wine is not fun, it's medicine, and it should be treated as medicine. Didn't the great physician Ibn Sina say, wine for the intelligent is paradise, wine for the stupid is hell. You drink it, but you must know the measure. Wine in excess is poison. Interpret, interpret. Omar drank, his insides were on fire. He hadn't touched wine since his buddy's feasts at the madrasa. A shout in the bazaar. Vidari cloth, the dream of emirs and viziers. 
Winter is coming. Who wants a Vidari cloth? Omar's heart throbbed like the spleen of a running horse. It is easy for emirs, staid viziers, to fulfill this and any other of their dreams. And the young poor scholar? The famous cloth. Its magnificent fabric is made in the village of Vedar, two farsakhs from Samarkand. Miracle cloth. Beautiful, with yellowish tint, soft and at the same time. Dense, it is not in vain, called in other parts of Khorasan brocade. But it was too expensive for him. For a dress of Vidari cotton cloth, one should pay from two to ten gold dinars. All right, what can you do? We'll manage. We'll have Vidari cloth clothes in time. And even better. But for now, this winter and the next, we'll make dough with a robe of coarse a cheap cloth. Guests from Koresim, said someone running past, out of brief. There are guests from Koresim in the right corner of the bazaar. Well, we should take a look. In the fall, before the cold weather, the most welcome guest in Sogd and Khorasan is a Khorezmian merchant. He brings cheap fish from the lower reaches of the Okus River. But his main wealth is furs, sable and ermine, weasel, ferret, fox, marten. He also carries candles and arrows, fish glue, fish tooth, ambergris, birch bark, dressed leather, honey, Slavic slave girls. All this is from Bulgar, where tireless Khorezmians often go with large caravans. Omar, having twirled in the crowd of noble buyers, decided to go home. He could not buy a beaver hat or a white-skinned Slavic slave girl. He would have time for it. Let him. His lips trembled with resentment. The best thing was not to go to the market, so as not to poison his soul. Well, all of them, with their furs. Don't be in a hurry, my dear, he heard over his shoulders. Omar was stopped by a big man in a shaggy sheep's hat. The scientist had just seen him among Khorezmians. But the big man spoke in Turkic language, and his face, swarthy and ruddy, with strong cheekbones, is Turkic. His beard and eyebrows are black. But the eyes... Omar had never seen such bright, clear blue eyes, except in Zangasaros. In the East, even light-eyed people do not have ocean clear gray, clear green, blue, blue eyes. They are always with a slight brown admixture. In essence, it is the same brown eyes with a clear green, blue with blue. Omar Khayyam has such eyes of indeterminate brown-green color that with the blue blackness of curly, shoulder-length thick hair indicates, according to knowledgeable people, the burning passion, incredible opportunities. The barber concluded that he had ardent blood. On the same, according to scientists, hints any discrepancy between the color of the eyes and hair, dark hair with light eyes, or conversely, dark eyes with light hair. The correspondence between them is a common phenomenon and speaks of balance. Can you tell me where I can have a sip here? I asked the newcomer. I smelled it from you a while ago. You were standing close. Well, I think he should know. In the bath, Omar answered with a smile. When you drink a cup of wine, every drunkard you meet considers you his friend. Where did you come from so blue-eyed? I am a Bulgar, said the man in a sheep's hat glumly. I've heard of the Bulgars, famous people. But why are you alone? How did you get here? As a hired guard for Khorezmian merchants. Would you like a drink? Come on. A drunkard you are. No, I've already had my cup. That's enough. That's right, that's enough. No, I guess you're not really a drunkard. You're still young. Will you be back soon? I don't know. A local, unless you count the fire-worshipping barber, he'd say, God knows. Man has no right to know or even not to know. Allah disposes of him. And the newcomer says, I don't know. Too bold. Yeah, 
A man. I don't know. Another rebel. It's hard to recognize a person right away. Unless, of course, he comes at you with a knife. This blue-eyed Bulgarin looks harsh and rude. Dangerous. But in fact, he seems to be intelligent and even good-natured. So it is with other peoples, tribes. Sheikh Nazir said, To understand another's thought, it is not enough to translate it from one language into another. It is necessary to know the history of the people, their life and circle of ideas. One should try to understand them. It is not easy, but it is necessary to understand if you want to live in peace with them. What should a man think about when coming home from the bathhouse? Not to get the dust on his freshly washed feet. To get home soon, to eat. Lie down, rest. No, perhaps it's not the wine. For someone who can't and doesn't want to think, pour a barrel of wine, nothing will flash, nothing will shine in his head. On the contrary, even that wretched semblance of thought, which he uses hourly, will fade away. It's all the fault of my restless mind. If it were not for it, I would live happily in my native Nishapur, teach my children meaningless prayers, read and interpret the Quran, and get paid in the form of sheep carcasses and sacks of grain. Man has no use for intelligence and giftedness at all. He only brings dislike upon himself by them. Like, say, a three-headed camel, a freak. I'll go to the madrasa here, talk to the scholars, and see if there's a place for Abu Tahir when he turns from mercy to anger. Who is that ridiculous, unformed, rushing at the entrance to the madrasa? Is it Eunice the butler? Very much so. But why is he here? There is another man with him. He is motionless, calm. When he saw Omar, butler. Eunice slipped behind the pillar of the huge portal. Omar was wary. No, I will not go in where the rascal Eunice is lurking. Hello, honored comrade in the craft. The ruddy, muffin-haired man bowed to Omar with a sad grin. Comrade. Omar looked puzzled at his clothes. Bright, colorful, the kind worn by prosperous merchants. Still, he was pleased to have met one of the local scholars. I am happy to see you, my dear fellow. The Samarkandian, fat, sleek, and like a comfort slave, continued heartily and quietly. My name is Zubair. I also do math. Or rather, I used to. Now that you're here, I guess I'll have to give it up. I hear you're writing a treatise on algebra. He's visibly drunk. There's some brown stuff caked in the corners of his lips. There are bags under his eyes, but his eyes are alert, careful, and friendly. Writing. Omar answered briefly. But don't we find everything about algebra in Khwarizmi's book? Not everything. Oh, exclaimed Zubair, surprised by his boldness. Abu Kamil. Abu Kamil, in my opinion, surpassed Khwarizmi. His algebraic calculus is more developed, and he gives a vast collection of examples. But unfortunately, they are limited to linear and quadratic equations. Al-Mahani? Yes. He included cubic equations. But even Al-Mahani couldn't solve Archimedes' problem of dividing a given sphere by a plane into segments with a given volume ratio. Ibn al-Haysam. He... Al-Kuhi. Is that... Abul Jud? All are far from complete. The shaken Zubair began to sober up. He pulled his head into his shoulders, rubbed his temples with the palms of his hands, and stared up at Kayyam from below without taking them away from his temples, as if to express his horror. Isn't that a little impertinent? I would say presumptuous, even boastful. Does such a statement sound in the mouth of a young, still unknown scientist? You're making an attempt? But science cannot stand still said Omar, embarrassed. Someone must continue what others have started and discover new things. Ah, I don't need fame. I want to know the truth, that's all. Zubair dropped his palms. 
the truth? Why do you need it, you little brat? Aristotle, Euclid, Apollonius. Omar got bored, waved his hand. What and why talk to such people? What a clever fellow. He had memorized a few big names and, not knowing at all what was behind them, was trying to make dust in his eyes. You've got the wrong guy. Fool the others. He will never enter their madrasa. Are there no real scholars in Samarkand? Well, let's say that the old ones were exterminated, dispersed. There must be inquisitive youth. Somewhere there live mathematicians, who are not like successful traders. Of course there are, and he will find them. Goodbye. No time. I have work to do. No, not at all. Come in. Have some of our bread. Thank you. Some other time. Hmm. Who smells of wine in here? Zubair sniffed. It was done so unexpectedly, and so ineptly, so roughly and clumsily, that Omar almost laughed. But when he realized why and for what purpose it was done, he immediately lost the urge to laugh. From me, replied Kayam humbly, green with anger. What can you do? Some people smell of wine, others... He rhymed the famous word. That's it, brother, comrade in the craft. Talking to a fool is a shame, so listen to Kayam's advice. Take the poison offered by the wise man, but do not take balm from the hands of a fool. Poor Omar. Kayam doesn't know that there are worse scoundrels than Zubair, but God willing, in time, he will know. Well, how? Eunice asked excitedly. When Omar left, the butler was hiding in the madrasa courtyard. How, 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 how? Zubair attacked. You wretched Gnus, why did you run away? And he held back. Our business is bad, brother. You're clever, damned. Hey, if he drank a cup of wine from the Mugha, as you say, he's not averse to it. I'd take him to his cell, get him drunk, and six the Mutasib on him. Shame. The judge would have thrown him out in the morning. We ourselves, we're not sober. But we're informers. It's been known for a long time. Trust the informer. And the sober ones. What of it? If you drink a whole helm of wine, if you drown yourself in it, who'll feel good or bad about it? You're a zero. Omar Kayam is one. You, for example, even got dizzy with pleasure when you found out that Kayam drank with fatigue. And of course, it doesn't occur to you that you yourself are a mistake, a failure of nature. Tell me, what annoyed Omar Kayam to the insignificant butler Eunice? Nothing. You just envy him, his intelligence, his beauty. Well, well. Oh, you resent him, you see. You fool. You can't even understand why you're unkind to him. You're scourging yourself, Eunice hissed. Do you understand? I do, said Zubair. Omar Khayyam, Omar Khayyam, what shall we do with you? Eunice, I have no idea. I put a toad in the house to frighten him and only gave him pleasure. He watches laughing, the son of a dog, a naturalist. You should have thrown a cobra. He would have made it catch mice. Look, you're no better than a cobra. You carry food. You could poison him. Oh, for God's sake. I have a wife, children. I want to live. Live. Stop. Zubair was shaking like a fever. He's a fool, but he's not a fool. Let him write his treatise. Don't let him get in the way. If he writes it, steal it and give it to me. I'll pay you well. 300, 350 gold dinars. There will be. Algebra, 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 almakabala. Write, my good man. Write your triatisa. But Omar didn't feel like writing. His mind was empty. He leafed through the manuscript and threw it down. Transfer the subtracted terms of an equation to the other part of the equation, where they become added terms. Reciprocally eliminate equal terms in both parts of the equation. 
the coefficient on the higher term of the equation is reduced to 1. Nonsense. Child's play. Nothing remarkable so far. His predecessors have it all. But even without them, these simple tasks, the treatise will be incomplete, for it must serve as a daily guide in controversial matters. The hardest part is ahead. He came very close to the third section of the treatise. The goal was clear in his mind, constructing the roots of normal forms of equations of the third degree. But he lacked live examples, like a man who has been sitting in a closed room lacks fresh air, Omar told the judge. I understand, Abu Tahir nodded. Well, come with me tomorrow to the countryside. You will visit the gardens, the fields, you will gather, he grinned bitterly, so many living examples that you will have enough for ten treatises. Good. And one more thing. Ali Jafar asks to hire two or three workers to help him. He can't manage with firewood by winter alone. Abu Tahir looked at him carefully. You could. All right then. I'll tell the butler to hire him. When Omar returned to his room, he found the girl with an open face. It's not illegal for a maid to do that. She was cleaning. A clear face, simple and familiar. Something very remotely like Feroza's face. He noticed her because he saw some resemblance to Farouz. Oh, Farouz. Would she haunt him all his life? Perhaps Farouzi had been as unpretentious and pretty and sweet in her youth. She was. He remembers. But Farouz is bigger, fuller, and this one is tiny. Her height is small, her mouth and nose, her hands and feet are childish. Only eyes, big, golden brown, with some special cut. And the look, adult, serious, even a kind of sickly look, as if she were about to scream. So it was hard to know how old she was. Maybe 12, maybe 18. All the women Omar knew were older than him. That must be why he had grown up so early. What's your name? Rehan. She didn't fight back too hard. She seemed to like him too. Suddenly she pushed him away and said in a frantic whisper, If you give me gold, I'll come to you at night. Gold? He let her out of his arms. Why do you want gold? He asked in surprise. What for? She was surprised in turn. It's always useful. Are you sorry? Or don't have money? I have money. No pity, Omar said with embarrassment. But she's clothed, clothed, fed, has a roof over her head. Why does she need money? To quench her natural greed. And how? How much to estimate the whirlwind of feelings that swirled in him? They can't be converted into dinars. You see, until now. Paid for love with love. I didn't know money could buy it. Now I will. Rehan stared into his eyes with her bright, extraordinary eyes. Gold-eyed monster, thought Omar, lighting up again. No, I won't let you go. Gold, you got it. Yeah, I want to raise the ransom money, she cried, to get out of slavery, to go back home to Hajjant. That's it. Omar darkened, hunched over, sank down tiredly on the couch. Yes, there's this side of life too. Well, he had exchanged some of his dirhams for dinars in the bathhouse to make it easier to store. Thirty-five silver coins for a gold coin. Omar suspected, of course, that the merry mug had cheated him. Well, God be with him. We'll get by. We won't go to waste. I'll give you five gold pieces, he said gloomily. And at night, you don't have to come. But Rehan came. After a long, painful night, he got up, cheerful and satisfied. Rehan was gone. Omar found his five coins in plain sight on the calculating table, which he handed to her in the dark. Are you sick? Abu Tahir said, glancing at his swollen lips. Feverish. Omar blushed. It happens. The judge grinned understandingly. You must take care of your health. They say that the odoriferous basil, Rehan, helps with fever. Maybe you won't go. 
I'll go. I'll definitely go. Well, goodbye. The judge's face is stern and stern, but in his eyes there's a hidden laughter. This is Mukhtar, my letter writer. The judge introduced Omar to a tall, thin, pale young man. He is a peasant. He's a good mathematician. He knows village life well. He'll tell you about local affairs. It's fall. In the small irrigation ditches, there is no more water. In the large ones, it is still transparent, its glassy surface sprinkled with fallen leaves. The sky is glassy, and the wind is glass. There is a quiet noise in the empty gardens. The last leaves are falling, in their light rustle, in the bare branches, in the cold air, sadness, thoughtfulness. For some reason, gardens are always sad at this time. The surveyor, who was riding on a donkey, took a flute out of his bag, looked at Omar's lips, and gave it to Mukhtar. The piercing sound traveled far through the thick, cold air. It seemed to be the cry of a road forgotten by people, the thin branches of fruit trees crying out, afraid of the near frost, the gentle laughter of the children who had been running in the garden a short time ago, in the summer. No, I can't bear it. The flute choked with a low, convulsive moan. Mukhtar, sighing, handed it back to the surveyor. Omar nodded gratefully. He would get off his horse, leave it, and wander, rustling the dry leaves into the tempting, mysterious depths of the vast, deserted gardens. It would be good to build a hut in the most secluded place, away from the roads, and live in it. Alone. No, with Rehan. Eat apples, sleep, see no one. My head is tired. Apples? Omar grinned at his naive dream. There are none. Harvested. It's gone. He looked around the trees with a keen eye and spotted one forgotten large pale green apple high up on a branch. The only one in the whole orchard. What luck. He jumped down from his horse, picked up a gnarled pole from the ground, one of those that are used in late summer to prop up branches laden with heavy fruit, and tried to reach for the cherished apple. But the pull was short. I threw it down, took a lump of dry earth, threw it, passed. The second one missed. Mukhtar couldn't resist, joined him. But the malicious apple did not want to fall. There was noise and laughter. Omar laughed with his sick lips curved amusingly. Gyu gyu gyu! and this alone caused uncontrollable laughter in others. The guard, who accompanied the magistrate together with the surveyors, took pity on the youth, rose on his stirrups, and knocked down the stubborn apple with the point of his spear. Cheerful and ruddy, they climbed back on their horses. Chu! Omar shoved the unfortunate fruit to Mukhtar without looking at it. By yourself, I'm not much for apples. Me neither. I'll give it to my sister. Thank you. Mukhtar hid the happy apple in his pocket. Omar thought of his sister. He felt like crying. Still no news from his family. They are still children, thought Abu Tahir, who was touched. And you would not believe that these youngsters are the best mathematicians in Samarkand. Great is Allah. He knows in whose head to put the light of a high mind. Let's move on. Envious, Omar nodded at a peasant who was raking twigs and dry leaves under the trees. Useful work, always in the fresh air. He looked at them sullenly, reluctantly dropped the rake and bowed tightly, as if it were made of wood. He was supposed to pay his respects to important travelers but he looked more like a brawler who would run up and smash his heat in your face. There's nothing to envy, said Mukhtar glumly. He has no use for labor. Fresh air needs bread too, even stale, if not fresh. Do you see how exhausted he is? Well, with a garden like this, that's the thing. It's someone else's garden. It belongs to the Hanaka, the garden and the field around it. Do you know what a Juftigao is? Land that a plowman can till in a season with a couple of oxen, said Omar uncertainly. Yes. Oh, Allah. What units do we use? 
We measure water by how much is enough for a mill. We measure cargo by how much a donkey can lift. Distance by shout by steps. Length by cubits by heels. It is amazing that we still create something. Thanks to the common people, the craftsmen, the humble craftsmen. Their clear heads, their sharp eyesight, accurate vision, sensitive hands. Otherwise we'd have built, who can say what a Juftigao is equal to? Turkic Koshlug, Omar remembered. And Koshlug? I don't know. Nobody knows. Confusion. If I were a scientist like you, I would first of all clarify once and for all all measures. Weights, capacities, surfaces, distances. So that there would be no loopholes for abuse. In the vicinity of Samarkand, Mukhtar told me, there are 15 to 20,000 Zuftigao of land. Out of them, peasant communities and urban trade and craftspeople own, on the Iskandergam Canal, 1486-2750, on the Mazakin Canal, 275 Zuftigao on Sangrasan. The total is 4,511. All the rest is Vakuf, the property of mosques, madrasas, monasteries, and sheikhs, imams, ishans, sayyids, descendants of the Prophet, free from all duties. Taxes are paid to the treasury by poor peasants. Peasants have nothing to live on, Mukhtar said quietly. They have to occupy vacant lands willy-nilly, and the Holy Fathers are not averse to annexing their plots to their estates. Some sheikha, who has thirty jufti go, seizes by force the same amount of other people's land, and then assures that altogether is thirty jufti gao, to which he is entitled, hence the strife. The matter comes to a riot. Abu Tahir, on the other hand, is a peace-loving man. The main thing for him is peace in the neighborhood. Jufti gao, as I said, is a controversial measure. It is determined by I. After all, a plowman is different from a plowman like a bull to a bull, and land to land. We should, having surveyed the population, identify a long-standing and well-tested plot that can be taken as a model, talk to the plowman, see the bulls he worked with, and finally clarify what is equal to Jufti Gao. We will measure by Tanup, because Tanup is more or less exact measure. In one Tanup there are 40 Kari, in a Kari there are six palms, a palm equals four fingers. A finger equals six barley grains. Forgive me. You know well without me what is equal to what. But perhaps you and Nishapur have other measures. Each district has its own Kuruk, its own Dirham, its own Tanap. It's a mess, I say. If I were a scholar... You will be, said Omar. If you mentor me. Ox. I wish I had a mentor, sighed Omar. By spring we must measure all the plots in order to firmly fix each owner's property, and thus eliminate disputes and disagreements. It's a difficult task. I can't do it without your equations. May I drop in on you sometime? To read your treatise. Come, more often. During the whole day, in the troubles in the fresh air, eating only dry snacks, we got hungry. It was already getting dark when we stopped at the Kanaka for a hot meal. The Kanaka was almost a military fortress. Hairy, dirty, but by no means skinny, dervishes having smoked hashishu and eaten pilaf or pea soup, sprawled in their stinking dens. Shrieks, groans, and sobs came from the dark, stinking cells. Bloody lazy bastards, the most harmful, the most worthless kind of people, lice in human form, and they're supposed to be saints. Omar did not touch his food, is it fair, he said to Abu Tahir as they walked down the dark road home, that so much of the best land in the district should belong to those who have never held a hoe? To give it to the peasants, what an abundance of fruit, what bread the state would receive. Abu Tahir did not answer for a long time. Omar could barely distinguish his sullenly bowed head in the gloom. The monks are our intercessors before Allah, Allah said hoarsely at last. They must be honored. And after a little more silence, 
We have not established this order, and it is not for us to change it. And my advice to you is, don't ask such questions to anyone else, especially not the judge. Omar wasn't working. Did the hard work of the last few days wear him down? Or did the cup of wine confuse him? Or Rehan? No, not the wine, or even Rehan. It was the Hanaka that poisoned him. To this day, he can't forget the stench of the holy drug den. If the monks offer their stink to the throne of Allah with their prayers, is Allah able to understand the essence of their prayers? Or is the stench the essence of their prayers? Poor old man Mohammed. There are many of them, in Samarkand too. Struggles somewhere in the mountains on a miserable piece of stony land to grow a handful of barley grains. And here, big burly men, on whom the land should be plowed like bulls, three Juftigao a day, lead a completely meaningless, idle life, and for this they get all the blessings on earth. And also eternal bliss in the afterlife. The fool and the scoundrel are rewarded, and the worthy are enslaved for their bread. I don't care about your justice, creator. I can't bear it. He was seized with a sudden dread, a sudden anxiety. It was as if the heavy beam ceiling were about to collapse on his head. Omar looked as if at a snake, at the coiled under the table surveyor's cord to nap, which he took for calculations, thumbed the book for notes, threw it in the corner and jumped out into the garden to see Ali Jafar. There were four of them. Before proceeding to business, they amused themselves with cloudy cheap wine, snacking on slices of radish sprinkled with salt. When they saw the stranger, the newcomers, hired to help Jafar, fearfully covered the jug with their clothes. Do not be afraid, Ali Jafar reassured them. He is ours, though he is a scholar. Please love and welcome Omar Khayyam, Aman, Usman, Hassan. Omar was surprised to see a blue-eyed Bulgar among them. And you're here? I'm here to earn a few coins. I didn't get along with the caravan drivers. I've fallen behind them. I've decided to live in Samarkand. Well, you can't make much money from these stumps and driftwood. That's true. You're a man of science. Will you buy a book from me, friend? An ancient book. Rumi. He pulled a worn bag from a split stump, rummaged through it, and took out a tight parchment scroll. He untied it, turned back the end of the wide strip, and stunned Kayam. Ataraxia, an exposition of Epicurus's teachings. Omar even shuddered. He had long wanted to familiarize himself with this doctrine, but the Bulgaran looking at Omar immediately cooled his impulse. No, I think it's of no use to such a young man. To Epicurus comes a man tired, beaten, frowning, who seeks respite from the world with its no cockney squabbles. You have everything ahead of you. You'll make it. Omar is bitter. It seems that I, with my habits, will have to resort to it very soon. Kayam's hands shook as he took the heavy scroll from the Bulgarin smooth, clear lines. What a pity. He knew almost no Greek Rumi language. He remembered only what Sheikh Nazir had taught him in between. But what you don't know, you can learn. Can't you read Rumian? Bulgarin guessed from the annoyance in the young Persian's eyes. I will teach you if you give me at least a little for bread and wine. I could, when I finish my treatise. But you, how do you know Rumish? Where did you get this book anyway? I don't think there should be literate caravel guards. You never know, grinned the newcomer. And the book, it's from far away. All right. I see that everyone here is a member of your own people. So be it, I will tell you about myself. Brothers, I am not a Bulgar, I'm Russian. Infidel. 
Ammon gasped. Yes, a Christian, confirmed the guest. Don't be afraid. I don't bite. Don't shy away from me. We ate together. We drank together. My name is our Slavic name, Svedozar. And my Christian name is Theodolus. Where did you come from? Paidul, Omar asked. Svedozar, Paidul. I don't know how it makes sense, but Svedozar sounds much better by ear. And in sense, much better, answered Svedozar. Theodul means servant of God. We also had better sounding old Iranian names. Vartazar, Tigran, Anushirvan, and Turkic names. Algu, Baybars, Taragai, and nowadays... He rolled his eyes amusingly. Abu Amr Ukhaiha ibn al-Jula. He almost choked and swallowed saliva. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab al-Safa. Who, not knowing Arabic, can memorize and say what it means. Svetozar Peydul. They laughed, and there appeared between them all at once that special closeness of good and honest people. When they all have one consciousness, they are each other's friends, and nobody will do anything bad to anybody. Trust. Four Muslims, a scientist mathematician, a janitor and landless villagers, completely forgetting that Svetozar is a stranger in faith, listened to his story like an Indian fairy tale. Born somewhere in a village on the Dnieper, Svetozar was three years old and fell into the Pechenej Polon. Ten years disappeared in captivity. That's why he knows the steppe speech so well. Among the Volga Bulgars, he can pass for a Bulgarin, among Turanian Turks, for a Turk. Once the Russian army, having beaten the Pechenegs, freed the prisoners. A lonely homeless man, Svetozer was appointed a novice in the Kiev Pechersk monastery. Like our Kanaka, Ali Jafar remarked. Sort of. Here he reacquainted himself with Russian speech, learned to write and read, and mastered the Rumian language, as well as the Hebrew. Literacy is honored in Russia, but he was beaten and offended many times and without truth. He was more offended for the Temerds, because he himself was one of them. The monastery had seized all the land in the district, and the Mujiks had fallen into poverty because of it. Bear with the Pechenegs, from their princes, endure, and also from idle monks, God's insatiable servants. Is it infinite human patience? It's just like us, sighed Omar. Great evil has accumulated in the people, continued the stern Sevetozar. You know, in a drought, drop even a small spark into the grass, and the whole steppe will burst into flames. And so it was here, too. There was a chance. The year before last, a new hostile tribe came from the wild fields, the Kipchaks of Sharukan Khan. In Russia, they were called Polovchans. On the river Alta, the aliens broke the Princess Yaroslavich's, so scared them that Sviatoslav fled to Chernigov, Izyaslav and Vsevolod took refuge in Kiev. Poor people fled to the gathering. Veche asked Izyaslav for horses and weapons to fight off the Kuman's hordes. Izyaslav refused. Either he did not want, afraid of his own people, or there was nowhere to take and there was a riot. They wanted to kill Kosnyachok, the Evoda, the villain, he ran away. There was a pogrom in the prince's court. Stephen, Bishop of Novgorod, who was visiting Kiev, was killed by his villains. A bishop like our Mufti, Omar determined. Sort of. Strike the Holy Mufti, Amun marveled. Why, he's got it coming. A crowd of rebellious people, Svetozar told further, attacked the Kiev Pechersk monastery to seize, in the halls of the church, their treasures. He confessed, I led those people, for I checked the way to the sacristy, the repository of the monastery's riches. 
to rob the holy Hanukkah. Usman was amazed. Why rob it? To get back what's yours, and to raise the nest of the accursed true robbers to the ground. They are no longer a living thing. Just like us, said Ali Jafar. Well, there was more shouting than good. Izyaslav, having fled abroad, returned with the army of Boleslav, the Polish Tsar, and made a cruel massacre over us. He blinded some of us and deprived others of their stomachs. I managed to escape. After a long journey, I came to the Volga, to the glorious Bulgar, hired in the caravan guard, and here I am now. And then, I can't go back. I guess I'll be wandering around with the caravans. Maybe I'll return home in 10 or 15 years when everything will be forgotten. It was as if the earth had opened wide and was filled with angry voices. We, who are always busy with ourselves, do not know that right now, at this moment, somewhere far away, in a foreign country, the same passions are boiling up as here, and people like us are fighting for the same piece of bread. It seems that you have everything like us, Omar summarized. We cannot have one thing, to persecute princes, to beat monks. We are obedient, humble, God-fearing people. Ali Jafar is sly. We were not always humble. The rich are forgetful. The people remember everything. My grandfather, peace be upon his ashes, told me that in Bukhara, poor people, it was long ago, revolted against the king, and a Turka Brui helped them. The Khans had a hard time. They threw them out of Sogd, but another Turk, the steppe ruler Karachurin, suppressed the rebellion. And there was also Mukana, the leader of people in white clothes, who fought long and bravely against the Caliph's troops. And not so long ago, in Tabaristan, and in Romtan, where the villagers attacked Ismail Samani, said Aman in a low voice. In Samarkand, Ishaq ibn Ahmed rebelled, Usman said quietly. And the Karmatians were outraged, Ali Jafar reminded him. So, as you see, we have no shortage of courage. Well, when did this happen? All is in the distant past, Omar waved his hand dejectedly. What happened once in the past, my grandfather used to say, will definitely happen again in the future. We will revolt again when we get a chance, Ali Jafar whispered, looking away. Rebellion, rebellion, what is the use? muttered Omar, suddenly thinking. Rebellion is the business of Ali Jafar and these three. Omar's business was to help the poor people with his knowledge. If only an hour ago he had been sick of even thinking about work, now his chest ached and his hands hardened with the urge to get down to pen and paper. For now the work was meaningful. The sooner he finished the treatise, the sooner there would be peace in the long-suffering land. No more confusion in algebra, no more strife among men. Clarity is honesty. Get to work. Now get to work. That's it. I'm an outcast too. I'll buy your book. How many dirhams can I give you for it? I don't know how to count in dirhams. We don't use coins. We have hryvnias. Bars of silver. We cut off as much of it as we need. But Ali Jafar and I know how to count in dirhams. Omar scraped up the courage to joke. We bought a book together. Ali Jafar, blushing, chuckled. Well, your book is old, rare. I give you ten dirhams for it. Here, take it. Where do you sleep at night? In the caravanserai at the Kojent Gate. Ask for Hassan Bulgar. All right, I'll find you. You will teach me the Rumi language. It would be more convenient here, but I'm a stranger here. I understand. You will come, won't you? When I finish my treatise. Right, my good man. Write your treatise. Eunice, the butler, was looking at them from the gate leading to the courtyard. Drink with your idol, Hayam, and don't worry. 
that tomorrow you will meet death on your way. Consider that yesterday you said goodbye to your life, and now enjoy love and wine. The young serpent is insatiable. He is quick to gratify his rightful voraciousness. The whole world of human knowledge and the whole world of human sensations Omar wanted to comprehend with a clear mind and a pure heart. Was it not for this reason that Feruze occupied such an important place in his soul, and now Rehan had taken possession of it? Why not? He saw nothing wrong in their relationship. Neither did he see anything wrong with the cup of pure wine he drank when he was tired. They were good for him. He's a healthy man. He still doesn't know, and he won't know for the rest of his life, what a stomachache or a Tuthachi is. Why didn't you take five coins, said Omar, pouring her a bowl of delicious wine when Rehan came to him again at night, spreading the spitzy odor of Fragrant Basil to justify her name. Five coins, eh? Rehan waved her hand nonchalantly. Not enough for the ransom anyway. Also, you've shamed me, shamed me, I too, to pay for love with love. And then, uh, whatever happens, golden-eyed monster. He pulled her to him with force. Dear friends, thank you for watching the video, voiced and translated into English by Vyacheslav Orlov. Peace, kindness, and love to you and your family.